Let's yeah. talk about. Uh, let's talk about the child protect protective services. Sure. Well, I mean, it. Let's start there. Are those things. Right. Um. So keep in mind, I'm I'm not a social worker, and while I do have a degree in criminal justice, and I have some knowledge of how. CPS works in the context of police and and when when police are called to to domestic situations where children are involved um, I, I, I'm not an expert on CPS and how they operate you don't have to be it's the matter of how do they work in actuality not how they they're supposed to work on paper right 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 maybe they will watch the interview and change the policy a little bit right uh, so yeah. um, well, I do have experience, obviously, with with CPS, and uh, it wasn't great. You called them? Um, I have called them before, yes, uh, in my childhood. And what, what do they say on the other end of the phone when you call them? Mm -hmm. uh, we will just come in 20 minutes and break the door out and <laughs> uh, sort everything out, or no. just stay put, uh, listen to your mommy and daddy, uh, take your pills, shut the fuck up, and what do they, how do they answer their phone? I mean, there's a whole sequence to suicide hotline, and how sure. they... Suicide hotlines have a script and sort of things that they have to ask. I, I would assume that CPS on some level has something similar to that. They have to ascertain the situation, they have to figure out if there's child abuse, they have to figure out if there's sexual abuse or, or drug usage in the household that would put the child in danger. Or something to that effect. Um, I have had two experiences in my lifetime with CPS. And I don't fully remember all of the details of how they operated. But it, it was around the same time of my life. Around 11 or 12 years old. And I, I had contacted CPS once. for be, be, Because I was experiencing child abuse. And... The second time CPS was called when I reported um, sexual abuse in, in my in my family. And um, they seemed pretty professional, but at the same time, there has to be some level of detachment there to um, be because I'm sure it's difficult. I'm sure it's difficult for them to have to listen to horrible stories of abuse and rape and all the other things they have to, you know, childhood neglect and abandonment and all these horrible things that they have to deal with on a daily basis. So I'm sure that some level of professional distance is required in, in a, a CPS investigator. Actually, I wouldn't mind becoming one in some capacity. I think perhaps I would be good at it. And then you would either, you'll fight, face the regular challenge, whether you start fighting the system or you just accept that things are messed up naturally and that uh, you, you sit in that chair and you listen to those horrible stories, but you can't change anything fundamentally. That would, if, if that were my experience working for the CPS or if that were my experience working for, say, the local police or something to that effect, I would probably leave very quickly if that were my experience. Because I would become so frustrated, I would become so angry at an inability to help if, if there were regulations and things that were preventing me from carrying out what I know to be justice and what I believe in my heart to be the right thing to do. That I, if, if, if I were stonewalled by those kinds of things, I would, I would not be in that job for very long. I can, I can say that with certainty. And have you thought of that, <laughs> maybe very well, that, that uh, understanding that once you're in that job, uh, you either play by the rules and just do what you can on your level and r accept that the system is messed up and that children are being mass traumatized. Uh, and and this, this, this kind of thinking keeps brightest people from working for police I, and yeah. for agencies uh, for the... For the I think there CBS. are plenty of good ethical people out there who want to make differences, who are hampered by regulations and by things, that, bureaucratic red tape and, and all sorts of other things that prevent us from doing what we know to be just. Like me and my experiences with the mental health system, Sim similar story, yeah. I, I could become a screw in another 
organization that would mass, you know, not mass traumatize, but just handle like a herd of cattle, of people yeah. of a somewhat higher traumatization level than myself. And that comes that comes when higher up people, you know, who are very wealthy, they don't see those of us at the bottom strata of society, if you will. They don't see those of us at the bottom as people. They see us more as objects. That happens. And they don't care what happens to us. So it's like, ah, oh, well, you know, we can defund the mental health system infrastructure in this country because who cares, you know? Who cares about them? It's just the poor. They're not people, right? You know? Yes. And it, 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 it's, it's incredibly frustrating, and it's something that upsets and infuriates me. Um, we don't take care of people like we should be doing. I think about it as well as, and do those rich, presently powerful people, can they be so sure, certain that none of their descendants will fall out of, the w w lose the wealth and become part of the, right. of the system and right. become customers of those same uh, child protective services or mental health services or police and, or go to jail or the psych ward or whatever. Exactly. And when those kinds of things happen, it's... It seems to be more often than not that the wealthy parent wants the situation to go away, but not to resolve it, not to fix the problem, but just to pretend like the problem isn't there. And in my own experiences with... Uh, so, so my sexual abuse came to, at the hands of uh, my, my uncle, one of my uncles. And um, his parents, my grandparents, were wealthy at least at the time at the time of my childhood and the, the, the sexual abuse and they clearly wanted the whole thing to go away and so this is the first time that i'm sort of speaking about this on camera that, that is being recorded this is the first time that i've spoken about my abuse in an interview that is being recorded but i'm also writing about it as well it, it takes courage for men to admit sexual abuse it does. it's certainly something that we need to to talk about more to stop the perpetration and the cover-up yes, and the, absolutely and the case exactly the, the story that you were describing is a good reason why we need to talk about it more openly and right. not bother well, they don't understand my great really trauma seems to follow a certain almost like mathematical series mm -hmm. mathematical progression mm -hmm. fractal whatever you you call it a certain sequence exponential that, growth curves and sort of things it can't grow and it can eventually kill you until you just decide that i have a sequence of trauma and i need to interrupt interrupt it and decrease it and eventually right. heal it uh, the system doesn't really allow that understand that so right. the tendency of uh i know i mean i'm a little afraid to have some discussion with that with uh, some strong leftists because sometimes I've been accused of blaming the victim and I don't exactly see that at all okay uh, tendency of that's what's known from psychology writings tendency of let's say a rape victim to sort of become paralyzed with fear yeah. ther therefore allowing themselves to be more or behaving in a certain way as a result of their previous right. trauma that in predisposes them to the next occurrence of a similar or a different kind of trauma. Mm -hmm. And to me, that follows that sequence. Certainly, putting someone in a, in a new foster family, that, 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 can, that, that can lead to that. Right, and it, and it goes back to what you were saying with, like, with the way that we are culturally sort of programmed and, and conditioned to be. As men, we're expected to bury our trauma, to not feel to not express our emotions. Don't talk about it. Don't cry. Be a man. Take it out on someone else. Take it be, out on be, someone be else. A, kill a be, kitten. Be, 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 be an abuser because it's better for you to be an abuser than it is for you to cry. To be, or to be abused. Uh, to, uh, so yeah, kill a kitten or better channel it in a way that makes your, uh, brings you money. Right, I, 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 it, it frustrates me that, that this society victim blames, like you mentioned victim blaming, this society victim blames. Society does it. When we're, when we're, talked about, when we're, we're talking about rape, for example, there's a huge amount of blaming of the victim. How you were talking about, how there, there's not a lot of uh, support for men who have been raped. Um, 
because on some level our society still struggles to understand that male rape victims exist. And also, is it their fault? Do they want it? It all ties into that very... It's the same thing. Well, how do you know you didn't want it? Well, yeah. And and then when you when you have a female victim of rape, then it's like, well, you know, well, look at her clothing, and she, well, you know, she was drunk, and she went to a bar, and she did this, and she did that. The onus is always put on her. Yes. And and with 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 male victims, the response is different. To where the onus is not put on the male victim, the onus is not put on the usually the male abuser either. Yeah. The 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 whole societal conversation is no, we don't talk about that. No, male rape does not happen. Doesn't male victims happen. of sexual assault that doesn't occur. No. Doesn't occur. Doesn't occur. And the thing is, I I don't know. I I only know about it from. Well, I know about it from several places actually. So I don't only know it. I know mm-hmm. that there was a ten part in, in history of psychology when, well, if you have cancer, then you're on some unconscious level. You want cancer. Uh, and from a certain extent, that can be said about traumatized people that some unconscious part of them opens the door for more trauma. But is it their fault? It's not about blaming someone. It's about healing the the unconscious part that keeps opening the door for more trauma. And our mental health system is so broken. I don't know what healing can occur. I don't know how it can occur. Despite the system rather than because of the system, as right, I right. understand. And, and I've... In the last several months or so, I've started seeing a therapist, and I've sort of started processing my abuse and my trauma, and it's it's been difficult because I've had to deprogram myself of the belief that it was my fault. Yes, you have to forgive yourself. This is one of the things I. This is kind of how I came back to Christianity. Is that fundamentally it's about forgiveness. You want you want a system in place which which emphasizes forgiveness and, and redemption of people forgiveness of self in the first place right and that can be attractive for many people i'm not religious myself but but i understand why people are for, you, you know they're looking for a thing that they're they're, they're looking for a, a support structure you know yes and forgiveness that can extend far beyond that let's say you cut yourself with a, I don't know, a, a chisel and you later look at this chisel and you try to forgive the chisel for cutting yourself with it if you do some kind of manual labor handiwork labor i've i've had say hand injuries and okay. that that, pra- that practice helps you forgive you forgive yourself for the situation you forgive that you you injured yourself no so certainly certainly that same principle can be applied to many injuries and to more complicated trauma it's With- certainly how can it be your fault? And even if some right. some part of a person with a existing trauma history opens door the door for more trauma, mm-hmm. how is that their fault? It's just a part of the progression, the sequence that has to be right. interrupted somehow before it kills the host of that sequence. And I was able to interrupt the the the, the cycle of trauma, and I. And this is something that, you know, uh, I've been thinking about lately is the idea of, you know, people who... I I don't understand the people who perpetuate that trauma because I understand that it is what they know. They don't know any better. They, 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 they may not. But at the same time, like, I am aware of the fact that I, I was cognizant of my abuse. I was cognizant of the idea that I could perpetrate it and I decided not to because I didn't want to hurt people in the way that I had been hurt. I didn't want to do to people what people had done to me. I didn't have a desire to to get back at the world. I wanted the pain to stop and I didn't think it was going to stop if I just transferred that pain to someone else by taking the role of an abuser and saying, well, now I'm going to cause this pain to this person because it's the only thing I know. I, 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 I don't understand that. In my understand, later understanding that came, in my later understanding, that's what being a true Christian mm. means, is mm. interrupting the cycle through forgiveness. And clearly, forgiveness, redemption, healing, all that sort of stuff. Clearly, a culture is not set up to... to to 
to to interrupt cycles like this uh, right go yeah go kill a kitten the camera doesn't see it yeah go outside of the camera view and i don't know kill right. a puppy or something like tor torture a tor torture a cat or something uh, so yeah certainly that that element in our culture right is still very strong and the laws and the system is only there and that's and that's the weird thing about the law is you know the more I've learned about the law through my, my degree in criminal justice and, and my continuing study of the law on my own, um, w this country is set up to be extremely punitive. We are very focused on the idea of punishment for punishment's sake. Which well, is a form of perpetration in itself. It's, it's perpetration of the abuse. It's, it's continuing that cycle of abuse. And saying, you abused this person, you raped them, you murdered them, for example. So therefore, the state is going to abuse you in retribution to the wounded party. Does that give the wounded party anything? If, 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 if my uncle, who sexually abused me for two years, were to be raped in response to that. And he probably was in prison because that what happens to abusers, they get abused in prison. That's right. how society in prison works. But even if I knew that he was raped... That doesn't give me anything. I don't take pleasure out of that. I don't say, well, good, you know, that's what he deserved. Uh, even though I might think that, but at the same time, like, that doesn't do anything for me. That doesn't improve my life in any way whatsoever. Yeah, and also, let's say he gets out of jail after, like, at the age of, I don't know, 70, and he'll just be a, a wretched man living on the, uh, probably some kind of, welfare what's the point of such yeah he uh, he, he he'd, treatment he'd have no life and, and and i mean at the same time when we look at rape especially with rape of children the last time i checked the recidivism rate uh the the rate the the likelihood that a person is going to commit the crime again the recidivism rate for uh like child rape was somewhere around 97 percent i know it's very high so isolating them from the society in the current state of matters is the only way that can be handled interrupting yeah. the chain oh, there's another factor okay you let them do it once and you figure offer them to interrupt the chain if yeah. it happens 10 times uh then it's already maybe it's yeah there is no way that that can be interrupted one of the things that hurt me a lot over the course of sort of uh seeing this recent investigation into my uncle uh, in, in, in 2014, it was, was my grandparents' reaction and how they were so focused on defending him against the accusation at all costs. Uh, it probably has to do with their pride and, I don't know. Yeah, they... it, pride, shame, denial, all kinds of things. And uh, I, I can understand. I can understand how horrifying and how agonizing it would be for your grandchild to say, you know, my uncle sexually abused me. I can understand that they'd have denial. Yes. But it's been 18 years since my abuse ended, since I reported it. And I have this vague memory of my grandmother uh, asking the CPS woman not to do anything. Uh, she, she was trying to protect her son. Sounds very productive. It, it, uh, he's 17, he's almost an adult, this will ruin his life, please don't, you know. And I understood that, uh, I understand that now. But, but, but my, 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 my understanding of my patience from my grandparents has run out because they have had 18 years to come to terms with the truth. And they have n barely, if at all, made progress in that acceptance of what their son is and instead of trying to help him they were trying to protect him which really all that was doing was enabling him to continue sexually abusing children yeah that's certainly and certainly uh, yeah in my opinion the most productive thing to do was to make him admit his original trauma and do something about that before before the amount of cases was so great that it makes sense that right. keeping him locked up is the safest 
Right. I, I, don't, I don't know what happened to him. I don't know what made him a pedophile, as it were. A um, counselor could find that out, probably. Right, but so. from a story that I heard from a couple of my aunts, is that, you know, when he was about eight or so, he went to a summer camp and something happened. They don't know what. Uh, he came back and he was different and something was wrong and they told my grandparents about it. And my grandparents were too busy. They sounds, didn't. They 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 ignored it. Sounds like that was the time when things really had to be investigated and proper measures. If if they had taken responsibility then and there, they could have prevented their son from sexually abusing me. They could have prevented him from sexually abusing all of these other children that he has abused. So it is like an epidemic. The the yes. the tendency of the uh, so if we see that the Stockholm Syndrome is the tendency of the victim to align themselves with the perpetrator mm -hmm. during an act, mm -hmm. the original Stockholm Syndrome, the Stockholm Syndrome term came when uh, there was a bank robbery in Stockholm and mm -hmm. bank employees refused to testify against the robbers mm -hmm. and were somehow convinced that the robbers were good people. Yes, because that that's the way to feel safe. That's like the last that last thing that our uh, psyche clings to in an extreme situation. Yeah, sometimes makes it align itself with the perpetrator. I mean, my 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 grandparents are definitely clinging to their denial and their inability to face what their son has done, and and it. If I had been the only victim, that would be one thing. But he, he abused many children after and me. And some of those children may, may align themselves with the perpetrator and became, become abusers themselves. Yeah. And, yeah. of course, to treat them, look at it from a punitive. Mm -hmm. Is that the word that you used? Yes, punitive. From the punitive perspective, it's absurd. The point is to make sure that they don't align the, the work with, that, with them at that level. So they don't right. align well, themselves with the well, there are, there perpetrator. Are, there are become... four philosophies of criminal justice, as it were. So you have the punitive, or what's also called retribution, which is to punish... Eye for eye, yeah, tooth eye for, for an tooth. eye, tooth for a tooth. Punish it just for the sake of it being punished. Uh, uh, lock them away for the rest of their lives, or the death penalty. Uh, you have deterrence, which is prevent the crime before it happens. You have incapacitation, which is we should lock them up for the rest of their lives because they're a danger to society, they're a threat. And there's rehabilitation. And, and what I found is that the United States is and always has been incredibly focused on retribution and seemingly nothing else. Sounds very Christian. Yeah. Um, very Christian. <laughs> well, yeah. Very, very medieval Christianity, I suppose. But um, no, I'm, no medieval, I'm not saying medieval Christianity was very Christian either. Right, you right. Know, eye for eye is not is not a Christian model, and it's it's horrible. It's expensive, and it is horrible, It makes yeah. the whole world blind. As someone like Gandhi or someone like that. Said. It was it was it was Gandhi. Yes. Yeah. Eye for eye. So yeah, we end up with a system where everyone is uh, either locked up or among the traumatized people. Or right. they have so much money that they keep perpetrating, but they can get locked up because they have so much money. Right. And, and I mean, there, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of areas of society where we have this, this punishment-focused philosophy, as it were. What for? I, I don't know, because it's, it does not work. It and multiplies I mean, anger. Being an academic, I've, I've read studies retributive policies punitive policies do not work they do not reduce crime they do not deter crime the death penalty does not deter crime it does not it no. just keeps some people in a pitiful state of mind awaiting for years it is punishment the for the rod. sake of punishment and you know what honestly if they were just being honest if they had said god demands blood so blood shall be shed okay sure that's one way of putting it. That's one way of understanding the retribution uh, aspect of it. You could say, 
you could say, well, yeah, we're not doing this for our own sake. We're not doing this because we think that punishment is for, for the help of society. We're doing this because this is what God demands. Okay, well, maybe I could understand that a little bit more then. I don't understand who's God. I mean, in some in in some way, that measure uh, God demands blood. It was a measure of I don't know in more in order more primitive order societies. Yeah, it was it could be an element of population control, and it could be an element of breaking people, shaking people back into senses. Like let's say picking a person at random and yeah. burning them, so other people feel compassion towards them as it happens and that break brings them makes them more human the idea of the noble sacrifice sort of and then which also fits in with christian mythology you know the sacrifice of christ that, you know may and I'm, I'm just saying that they may have done it for a different and maybe a totally opposite purpose than let's say what happens in the deep south and right a black person is being locked up for I know, 20 years for having a blunt in their pocket right well you know the uh, school to prison pipeline is something that i've been railing against for years it's something that i don't understand why we do that and it, we're, we're taking young black children in the south and we're saying you see this here jail this is where you're going you you belong here you will be here one day this is your future i don't know i haven't been i've only been south as far as elder banks North Carolina. This is um this is something that I the school to prison pipeline thing is a thing that is more common in the South, because it's used as a tool of intimidation and fear and trauma against black children. And I they, believe it is. And it and it has this scared straight mentality and, and in you know you look at you look at these these so called tough on crime people like Kamala Harris who she she propagated this school to prison pipeline. I don't understand like what they're trying to accomplish because okay if we look at the quote unquote advanced white societies mm -hmm. uh, we have I don't know Western Europe we have Scandinavia yeah like a good liberal I like to think talk a lot about Scandinavia even though I have oh yeah the, there. The, 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 yeah the wonderful Nordic societies with their perfect uh, you know social harmony and all that maybe not so perfect but statistically there are some things to there are some things to learn there a well, multicultural multiracial multi traditional country like america can't be like like sweden no uh, yet there are things to learn uh, there are things to learn they uh, i think it was sweden who has eliminated most of their trash and they're actually importing trash from other countries to destroy trash. it burn yeah they burn their trash they burn their trash and uh th that doesn't sound very advanced i'm just I just want to say that self with all this racism and racial prejudice. So we have the, I don't know, the less civilized, I guess, Western, Southern Europe, Eastern mm -hmm. Europe. We have some colonial societies yeah. uh, that are still somewhat, uh, somewhat messed up from a history of uh, rich white people oppressing right, slaves yeah. or uh, natives. Uh, and then we have the American South. It's probably like at the very... <laughs> bottom of the hierarchy of civilized quote to quote i've seen civilized white societies where yeah i've i've seen racists on the internet who want there to be a border wall around the american south that that would make sense if they're the only ones inside that wall well see the see the thing is is that these white supremacists are arguing that the american south has the greatest concentration of black americans so therefore, if we put a wall around the black people, they can't hurt us anymore. It's it's insane. It's completely insane. What makes sense to get black people out of there before putting a wall? It and makes sense to get them white supremacists in there. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense to give black Americans a better life. And then, now I don't I don't demonize you know black Americans. I don't think that they're the cause of all society's ill. They're just wearing tr they were scapegoats for so many years. They were scapegoats they were scapegoats since the Civil War, since the Reconstruction era well, south. I think a little bit before that. They were scapegoats probably when they were captured in their yeah. native country. Yeah. And and the then they were scapegoats country. for as slaves and then they were scapegoats af after slavery and then They've they always were, been the scapegoats. They've always it's, been and somehow they're culturally adapted to it and to some way in some way it can be said that they're doing the best that they they're doing that, the best they can with what they got yes yeah so, so and that actually is a very interesting 
the thing to explore is how the heck do they deal with their yeah. trauma? They had so much, so much of it. Mm-hmm. Maybe exactly. It's something, something worth investigating. I mean, there were so many crimes that took place throughout all of American history, especially in the Reconstruction era, South after the Civil War. You know, and how the Union sort of just stepped back and allowed the Ku Klux Klan that was rising to massacre tens of thousands of, of black Americans. The Union was a very... Well, at the same time, sometimes Union forces were there to defend uh, blacks from whites in some places. So it's it's difficult. The, the, the Union forces worked in the interest of the capitalists that funded them. Exactly. They They did many good and bad things. And this is one of the many reasons why I'm not a capitalist, but uh, I, I, I you find... Don't have enough money to be capitalist. Well, <laughs> SSI yeah. doesn't... <laughs> yeah, that's one thing that you could say. I don't have enough money to be a capitalist. I like that, yeah. I don't know. But, I mean, the mindset of capitalism itself, the concentration of wealth into the hands of the top 1%, yes. I find that to be immoral. I find the control of industry by that same 1% to be immoral because there are so many people who slip beneath the cracks of this supposedly perfect American society, how the poor have been scapegoated for literal centuries, literal centuries. Yeah. they're, they're, They're the target of all societal ills. The poor, black, Hispanic any kind of immigrant. And I mean, you know, back in the back in the 1800s in the northern states, the immigrant to to be afraid of were the Irish. Well, the tendency is that some less established, more poor people come yeah. in and they're ready to work on lesser terms than the natives. Yeah. Cuz natives are already established and that's yeah. that's how historically labor unions in America were were broken up. Is let's bring some cheaper labor force from the outside that would cheap agree. labor, immigrant labor, illegal labor under the under the table. Okay, well, you know, I'm going to pay this immigrant. Yes. I'm going to pay this immigrant cents on the dollar. And hey, you know what? If he complains, if he makes any noise, I can just deport him. Yes, that's the most modern version of this same of that model. I I there's so much abuse that goes on in our society. There's so much violence. And that illegal labor, it ties into that whole fact is that when people live in the country, quote, to quote, illegally, and they have some internal yeah. conflict, let's say domestic violence, drank, One, right. angry daddy is unsatisfied with his place in his right. life, and he chases mommy with a kitchen knife around and around. And police doesn't come in because obviously there's the police is the enemy. They're afraid, they're afraid to be deported, so they would rather... Uh, they would only call it when something horrible happens, like someone gets stabbed or... Communities of immigrants, especially communities who are demonized, and we're seeing this right now in Fergie County with 287G. 287G is this agreement that that Fergie County Sheriff uh, Jenkins has entered into with ICE, uh, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, to deport people from the county he, he it, it sort of partially deputizes frederick county pd to cooperate with ice agents and allow them to facilitate deportations based on open civil deportation warrants that ice has out for uh suspected illegal immigrants and there are many cases and i've been researching this there are many cases where ICE will go to a person who is a legal immigrant and say, show us your papers, show us your immigration papers, and the person will show them to ICE, and ICE will say, these aren't real. Your, your papers are fake. Sounds like a good way to get bribes from people. Yeah. You, your, your papers are fake. You're an illegal. We're going to deport you. And or we, pay us a bribe of five thousand dollars. Yeah, or bribe us, and I'm sure. Uh, I'm I mean, sure it happens. I I'm sure it does happen. Yeah, ICE has been terrorizing this county since two thousand eight. Sheriff Jenkins is responsible for more than fourteen hundred deportations. And how the fuck does that help police? If police, if all of them see police as an enemy now. Police can bring in ICE. ICE can say that exactly. papers are fake and kick them out. So now a whole 
a whole group of people is afraid to call police and to stop perpetration right. of trauma that Right, and it, we have Muslim immigrants, we have Asian immigrants, and we have a lot of Hispanic immigrants. Yeah, you know the. And they're 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 being terrorized. They're being scapegoated. They are. I mean, look at uh, uh, like in, in the tradition in America is usually buildings aren't surrounded by any kind of heavy fences. Well, the right. mosque on Forty is an exception. It's like a fortress, and I wonder against whom. I suspect it is. It's armed against the angry hillbillies who watch too much too many fox news yeah i watch too much fox news then you know then then it's time to grab the shotgun and terrorize the muslims because you think they're trying to take over your country yes and it's like the sad thing is is that these conservatives in this county are being manipulated they just don't know that they're being manipulated of course and when 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 sheriff jenkins goes to conservative fundraising events and when he makes these screaming fear-mongering speeches about how the immigrants are coming and every county is a border county and this is a war and we're being invaded and you know this is a flood that's at the gates invaded i don't i understand I, that far he is aligned with at least one white supremacist organization which characterizes legal and illegal immigration from the southern border as a flood as an invasion and he's he's party to this rhetoric he uses this rhetoric he talks about how those of us who criticize 287g we are these lawless anarchists and we are these enemies because we are against law and order and we just don't want any laws of any kind and every county in this nation is going to be a border county and we have to step up because there's going to be a war this man is a monster Yes, and one thing that I think about this with this narrative is okay. Well, by by making people whose skin is not white fear yeah. police in general, all of a sudden, police only gets cold when there are extreme cases of exactly something. There's no preventive potential. Of There's police. no preventive. You you deterrence goes out the window, for police to be a positive community affirming preventative force that prevents crime from occurring in these neighborhoods it's not going to happen because by demonizing the hispanic community in frederick county jenkins has terrified them and they're all afraid of being deported 1400 people have already been deported in the last 12 years yes and if they are afraid of being deported they are not going to cooperate with police right they are not going to trust police and that distrust will create a vicious cycle where the police are more suspicious of the Hispanic community because the Hispanic community doesn't trust them. Of course. And so they will they will presuppose that the Hispanic community is committing more crimes than they're than they are because that distrust is seen as well clearly this Hispanic man has something to hide. Clearly we need to arrest and beat him, you know, and see what he's done. Yes. Let's let's shoot first and ask questions later. And certainly someone like Sheriff Jenkins would not be able to be a chief of police somewhere in New York City or right. any other major city. Or even city. in Baltimore, right. Or even in Baltimore because, uh, yeah, e- e- ethnical policing where you have informants of a certain ethnicity who, yeah. are, who may, if, if the ethnicity is not desperately poor and they have other opportunities, they may be willing to... To turn in their criminals yeah. uh, in exchange for the general co uh, trust and understanding with the police. And certainly he's not going to get that from the Hispanic community in Frederick if he if he does what he does. Right. And and I think about the oath that police officers take when they when they become officers. And part of it is to to uphold in good faith the public trust. I can say with certainty the Frederick County Police do not have the public trust, at least not the public trust of the Hispanic community, at least not the public trust of the poor in this county. Who they have the trust of are the rich, the bourgeois, the right wing money who are in this county who, you know, they want to live off the off the uh, near near the bay, you know, they all oh, they, they, they want to have this nice little cozy secluded life in frederick county 
But when, yes. when people are being beaten, when people are being arrested, when people are being forcibly deported, and not even because they committed crimes, what, what do the rich bourgeois in this city do? They're know. asleep. They don't care. Or they walk out for a small protest, but does that protest accomplish? I'm talking about the liberal sure. bourgeoisie. I'm more familiar sure. with the liberal bourgeoisie than the conservative bourgeoisie. Sure, the conservatives will stay home. The liberals will perform in a protest because they want to feel like they're a part of the solution instead of a part of the problem. But obviously, they're paying for it all, too. Right. So and, and, it, they're it, morally responsible for having a sub-livable wage, uh, I don't know, employee make them coffee in a coffee shop and then yeah. suffer from being underpaid. Yeah. Oh, I'll have an underpaid illegal immigrant, you know, you know give me coffee, but that's about it. They don't usually give coffee. They usually walk w w work in the back of the kitchen and wash dishes. Oh, yeah, do construction. Do, cook the food, do the construction, landscape my house. But you're people who are taking that in, and I'm speaking to uh, to uh, to liberal bourgeoisie. Uh, yeah. In some way, they're morally responsible for what goes into it, right? Yeah. And, and they, they don't want to take that responsibility for the impact that their policies and their voting and their money has on the community itself. And their lifestyle. They, they don't want to give up their lifestyle if it means that people's lives will be made better. They want to be seen helping. <laughs> they don't want to actually help. Yes. And that's another concept that's very... Heavily covered in the in the Bible, and it, it yeah, yeah. Jesus was fighting Pharisees. He was not fighting the state. He was not fighting the right. Romans. He was not. He was fighting the exactly that the what modern liberal bourgeoisie in America exhibits. And I'm 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 reminded of a of a Bible quote something like, uh, what is it the. Uh, the people who pray in public, they, they will not receive any reward for they've already received it. Yes. With the, with the adoration that they have been given for their public display. Yes. But, but and we you, have you know, a lot of that. Right. It says that you're supposed to pray in private so that, you know, it, it's not supposed to be a thing of... Or play, pray all at once like Muslims do. Right. Or uh, everyone looks pretty equal when they... And, and Muslims are so distrusted. Muslims are so demonized in this society ever since 9-11. Yes. You know, in the weeks after 9-11, and this is something that a lot of people don't know, in the weeks after 9-11, attacks on brown, black people in the United States went up 800%. 800%. I heard something like this, and I don't remember where I heard it, that I can't remember where I heard the amount it of people that got killed after the the attacks the, the September 11 actually exceeded the amount of victims of September 11. They yeah, just scattered across the country, and the country is big. And the United States engaged in a reactionary lynching, a mass reactionary lynching, mm -hmm. to avenge 9/11. And that's probably when the Frederick Mosque surrounded itself with a. With a fence. That was also around around the same time. That was also, you know, a few years af after that was when Jenkins enacted 287G. Sounds like a good time to Be move on with something like this. Right. And I mean, it's, it's this mentality that the immigrants are the problem. It's this mentality of, well, you know, you'd have nothing to fear if you have nothing to hide. You just need to obey law and order. Well, what about law and order? I think about civil rights protests. I think about Malcolm X and Dr. K. I think about Rosa Parks, you know, Kwame Ture, people who were protesting against the United States society, and they were trying to bring to light people's understanding of these are the unjust social and legal conditions for black people in America. This is what we're fighting. And we... We, we have to understand as a society that there is some element of resistance against the law that philosophically must be allowed in order for a society to examine itself. 
in yes. order for a society to be more healthy. We have to resist unjust laws like 287G. We have to resist unjust practices because we need to challenge the way that society works. Yes. A lot of people don't understand this. And it's like, oh, it's this one bad guy. Well, no, it's not one bad guy. It's how the system works. You can't point to one person who is the fault for the military-industrial complex. You can't point to one person who is the fault for why the mental health system in this country is overwhelmed, broken, and ineffectual. Why, the, why, why, why people are still being redlined why why black families and black black communities are being pushed away and segregated and and gentrified away no 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 no. let's not look at those people over there look at this nice shiny community that we've just built it's for white people only it's not for white people only officially it's the, it's more economic forces than right and no officially longer... right officially it's not for white people only if but effectively it, it is because most of the power in society, most of the wealth, is afforded to old white money. And there's another catch, and I know it's a very corrosive subject, is uh, white, white can also be subdivided into people of different descent, descents. And right. you would probably soon realize that uh, it's only a, one particular kind of white that holds all the wealth. And yeah. lumping all whites into the same category and setting them opposed to blacks is another right. way of mind, uh, crowd control and right uh, divide and conquer. Because if the working yes. class people, if the working class people of all races were to come together and say, "We're all in this same fight together. We're all getting screwed over by the system and the same system. We're all having the same injustices," but alongside us although some of us are receiving more injustice than others but we're all experiencing the same injustice in different ways yes it's Th like yeah that's what i observe so you have uh people i don't know working poor white people uh are angry at i don't know black people who live in public housing right then uh my neighbor was well, his tra life tragedy, he's a supporter, he's a Republican because Democrats came to power in Montgomery County and mm -hmm. he was training to be a, a firefighter. Mm -hmm. And uh, liber evil liberals came in and got women and black people and he didn't become a firefighter. Oh, after they took my job. Yeah, they took my job, which is kind of, I understand where he's coming from. And I, I've seen yes. similar, more stories like this about Republicans than Democrats. Overall, it probably evens out. It's thus so, keep it, keeping two parties. Yeah. It's sort of a weird, horrible thing. Like, the right wing was so easily able to... Divide. Use white male anger as a weapon against society and say, you know, the immigrants taking your job. And they that that's how they divided the working class. And first you have to create the certain expectations that you heavy expectations that you put on those white working poor males. Right. That they have to provide an individual uh, uh, like you create those economic conditions. They have to get a house of a certain type they have to right. raise their family in a certain way while they're being heavily taxed at every corner and as much as i personally despise fascism and white supremacy i think it's a scourge that needs to be you know ended i i i, I don't want to get along with these people i want to stop them as much as i want white supremacy to be destroyed even i have to admit that even white supremacists in this country are angry because whether they understand it or not, they're being screwed over by the same system. Yeah. So the white the white supremacist that I despise is still a victim of the same system that I'm a victim of. A perpetrator, someone who is being abused and continues the abuse. Just like my uncle, somebody who's abused and continued the abuse. And that seems to be a very strong element in this culture. Uh, yeah, that seems to be a very strong. It's a, it's a theme that keeps happening in American society that abusers 
the the abused become abusers and then they they wield power over people and obliterate their lives this is how i compare trumpism with stalinism a little bit yeah so stalin raped the hell out of soviet people and many soviet people and the descendants of those same peasants that he mistreated mm -hmm. i'm not saying all but there's a steady percentage of stalinists and some of them are stalinists because they worship the person who abused them or their pa parents or their families and uh, it's a form of stockholm right uh, it is a form of stockholm syndrome too many Americans worship the very same capitalistic system that puts them in poverty. So you have Trump, the the uh, a person who pretty much took advantage of the workers, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, cheated the workers, yeah, mistreated the workers. Absolutely, he is the image of the boss, and he is being worshipped in the same. Except the American system doesn't. I guess it's a little different, so. Uh, we can't clone Stalin and bring him into right, flesh but, again. But Tr and... Trump has a similar cult of personality that Stalin did, that Mao did, you know. Maybe. Stalin was a product of his own trauma, too. Right, exactly. He was very physically abused by a religious father. And he, he like me, rejected religion because it was so heavily associated with his abuse. Maybe, maybe, maybe. I'm not sure how it all works. At least in that's how I heard it. There are many attempts to decipher what was going on in Stalin's mind. Yet, sure, I, I, I'm talking about the more present for uh, present Stockholm syndrome. The I think Trump is a lot. Is it's election of Trump is a form of Stockholm syndrome. We we want to see a leader uh, of a country uh, as a leader of a country and exactly the same kind of boss that didn't pay us fair wages that mistreated us exactly it made us feel inferior and it's been recently found out that there were illegal immigrants who were hired to work on trump's resort in mar-a-lago very possible i'm sure they're yeah. sex slaves and other skeletons of raped children under floorboards or some other oh, pleasures in that there's plenty society. of skeletons in the closet in bourgeois high society, whether it be neoliberal or neoconservative bourgeois high society. Yeah, I'm not going to talk about uh, those right. conspiracies. Right, right, uh, sure. They're not helpful. Uh, yet, yet, unfortunately, yeah, we can investigate. So so the only way they can be passed on is, is conspiracy right. folk Well, tales. I mean, I wish I could investigate those kinds of things because on some level I... I I know how to investigate. I, I've investigated real murders, I academically, with you know the names being changed, and everything. And I, I had to examine every aspect of the case, and determine how well the case was handled, what the police got right, what the police got wrong, what they did right, what they did wrong, and whether or not I thought they had the right suspects and why and what sort of constitutional issues that they had in, in that investigation that um, led to the conclusion that the investigation had. They, they, uh, the, the suspects that they had arrested in connection with this crime, I'm not, con I'm not convinced that these men... Uh, raped and murdered the teenage girl that they are accused of having raped and murdered. I know that one of the men was there at the scene. I don't know that the other was. And they didn't even wait for the forensic evidence uh, to be finished. They went off of testimony of people that weren't at the scene. It's a real story, right? It's a real story. And they were persecuted for something that... This was in Columbia, Maryland in, I, w I want to say it was in the 80s or 90s. I'm not, I'm not sure of the exact year that this real crime happened, but I did examine it. And of course they were black, right? Black suspects, teenage white girl murdered. Okay, that explains a lot. And ideally, if I wanted to get to the basics of it as an investigator, I would look at the history of trauma to determine if someone is capable of being a perpetrator. But in the end, in this, in this punitive system, I wouldn't want to offer such higher order skill sets to persecute people and to punish them. No, I, I don't I, think so. I, I would only offer it to a system that would help 
heal the root cause and if necessary isolate the the perpetrator i mean i want to help make people's lives better that's why i've been doing some volunteering lately i've just recently volunteered a few days ago at the um it was last weekend at the uh, the Frederick Women's March on the 27th of January. Um, and that was, that was an interesting time. And there was a sense of people of all kinds of different backgrounds coming together for a mutual sort of defense of women of all kinds. And I was there with some of my friends and we were volunteering... It, 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 I, I would like to do more volunteer work. I would like to I, I, I would like to help people however I can. I really do want to help the immigrant communities in this county and perhaps provide them with you know basic legal services, perhaps try to prevent them from being deported by us. Mm. Um, but I've also found that in in recent weeks I've been thinking more about it and, even though I have my degree in criminal justice, I don't know if, you know, being an investigator, being a detective is something that would be best for me. And I find myself more interested, especially given the political realities of this county, I find myself more interested in wanting to help shape policy. Mm. And, and I'm still, you know, I'm still very interested in law, and I would love to go to law school one day. Yeah, if, try to volunteer somewhere where that would give you... Yeah. The right hook up, the right connections, a paralegal job, and maybe some way to get. Yeah, I've been looking for money. a paralegal job. I, I definitely need a job to be able to afford law school. That much is true. And if I can find a job that pays enough money that, you know, over time I would be able to afford law school, I would love to do that. I, I want to continue my legal education. I want to have a job that has some aspect of the law to it. If I can help shape, the criminal justice policy in this county i want to i want to get rid of 287g i i want to put somebody in power who is going to be ethical and who is going to want to put the people first and not their own desires and their own bigotry and their own power i want to change the culture and i mean i think that's part of how you change the culture when you change the people in power when you change what the people in power think that's a step toward changing the culture but at the same time you have to change the minds of the people at the bottom you have to change the minds of the millions of people yes if i can get to millions of people maybe youtube will help me do that maybe youtube can do that yeah and i mean we have to be focused on being better i mean we're, we're just we're not decent to each other we're not a polite society we don't care about our fellow man anymore south is a very deep south is a very polite society Pol i've experienced it culture. i yeah. experienced it but but at I the was same time trip, tripping balls on on outer on yeah in outer banks but but at the same time the the, the hospitality culture of the south masks real systematic problems masks real racism and in a way there's a facade to that hospitality culture because it's a shield against bringing the problems to light. Yes. It's, a, it's a shield against addressing the root causes of the systematic social problems within the Deep South. Yes, and they have a, a whole luggage of them that keeps them where they are. Yeah. We have a little bit of that here. Yeah, I mean we've we've got we've got gentrification to deal with. We we've, we've got a we've got a lot of people in this county who would rather not address the issues in this county. Would rather the poor, the immigrant, the the the, the Muslim, the Hispanic, the black just would rather all of these groups of people just go away. Yeah. Just just go away. Push them out to the boonies. Yeah, push them out to the boonies. It's 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 their problem out there in the sticks. Well, they'll get, they'll get addicted to drugs and hopefully they'll die because we don't think they're people. We don't want them around. We don't want them on our street corners. And it, yes, and in the end, the, there's something I think about a lot. The law of conservation of trauma is similar to the law of conservation of energy. Okay. You can't just get rid of people like this. It will come back to the rest of the society in one way or the other. And I think it has. 
This is why eugenics didn't particularly oh, work. Oh, God. No, eugenics is a horrible idea. Well, it works for breeding bigger apples, I suppose. Uh, okay, and sure. And when it came to human race, <laughs> it just eliminates a certain feedback that's vital for everyone to survive. So you just sort of do something and not and try to push away the consequences but right. uh, and that this is why you eventually it brings degradation yeah more more and more i've ended up seeing the united states as a as a if if we were to think of the united states as a person this is a person who is very blind this is a person who does not want to look in the mirror and does not want to say okay what are the consequences of my actions what have i done yeah, if that person li is, is was if the United States was a person, that person would probably be locked up in an insane asylum, and that person would be a horrible abuser. Yeah, locked up in some insane asylum. We can only help, but I mean, at the same time, like, still, the mentally ill in our society are they are scapegoated. They are scapegoated. They're pushed and out to the boonies by gentrification, and yeah, uh, and the the drug dealer lives. Uh, next door in the next door apartment and the therapist is no nowhere in sight so yeah it's it's a form of genocide perhaps and when <laughs> i l recently yeah. learned by watching uh something on youtube about urban planning is yeah. that in civilized europe they do have gentrification but they also have programs like public housing that yeah. work at the same rate so they just break up the ghetto and try to get uh People, poor people, the disadvantaged populations, integrated into new de developments at the same rate. They don't push them out to the boonies because there are no boonies in, in Western Europe. There are other countries, and yeah. I don't think they they resort to that. It's not like they send them to Siberia. Well, you know, with everything that's going on in England right now, then it's a whole thing of well, you know. Uh, Let's get rid of the Muslims and the and the Somalis and the Syrians. We don't want these non-British people to be in England. You have to be English if you're going to be in England. You know, let's get out of the EU. Let's have this hyper-nationalist, fear-mongering mentality where we blame the immigrants for the problem. All the Muslims are coming and they're going to destroy our great British empire. And and I'm sitting here going, what what, what empire? What Wh empire? Where's your empire? Show it to me, because I don't see it. It's an empire that's that runs on. It's there's still an econ economically there is still an empire, and the question is, okay, they get rid of all those uh, immigrants, foreign British. Uh, there's still a pretty significant gap between rich and poor in, in yeah in England. It's it's much greater than in many other European countries. Yeah. So if is that something they need to be proud of not as bad as the gap in the united states not as bad mm. and uh still still greater than in in many other yeah western european countries and i mean you know i also think of norway and how their criminal justice is focused on rehabilitation and you know what it works it works rehabilitation works there are some people who rehabilitation is not going to work on. If you're severely mentally ill, if you're a rapist and murderer because of severe mental illness, I don't it's think severe. See, to be an effective rapist, you have to trick people. Hmm. And if you're severely mentally ill and you you still have sexual drives, you would probably just be isolated before you realistically can. Right. Rape so someone, severe so. sociopathy or something of that. It's still usually a product of trauma. Right. It's a, it's usually a project of trauma. That's right. And I mean, I think that the worst of the worst are people who probably just need to be locked up for society's safety. But in no way do I think that we should just kill them. And they can be locked up in a way that's extremely inhumane to them. So it's another right. question. Institution, foster care for abused children. That Right. When, when we talk about the foster care abuse. system, we're talking about a system where children are taken away from physically and sexually abusive homes only to go to another home where they're being physically and sexually abused. So we take, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, we take, I just think, someone who's completely out of their mind, very mentally ill person, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, very deranged, mentally ill person. We take them from the street where they're abused and put them in an institution where they're abused. Exactly. Uh, and it goes back to the, the mentally ill being scapegoated. They're, and, and they are often victims. They're victims. They're of, victims of an industrial society. They're kind yeah. of, it's like, it's like we damage nature as we move, propagate capitalism. We damage ourselves as a species and we try to push away a certain part of ourselves and lock it yeah. up and lock it out. No, this isn't true. This isn't happening. Just like with my grandparents. It's not true. Our son's not a rapist of children. No, can't be true. Can't be. No, we have to push this away. This never happened. Never happened. Don't ever speak of it again. And another thing is, okay, well, they could have spent money on philanthropy. Yeah. On educating the masses about about Stockholm Syndrome, which is what I would do if, if something like that happened in my family. I'd be, be I'd be focused on trying to adjust on trying to address the problem and trying to help the people who need help. I have this crazy notion that people have dignity, you know, and that people should be treated as well as our society can possibly treat them. And if we don't do that as a society, we have failed as a society. We have no right to call ourselves the greatest country on the planet. I don't do that. Right. I, 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 I can't jive with that mentality. I can't either. It's a, yeah, it's, it's, it's a denial of reality. It is. It's a horrible denial of reality. Yeah. It's, it's absurd. It's very absurd. We used to dream about building cities and on other planets, and now it's people fighting themselves mostly now we're dreaming about a fucking wall yeah that would cost like several trips to the moon or we we used to trips to the mars we used to be dreaming about martian colonies and now we're dreaming about a stupid wall that would cost as much (laughs) yeah that would cost as much as a colony on mars yeah my god and it wouldn't accomplish much because most of the illegal immigrants still come by plane you can sail around the wall. You can tunnel under the wall. You can fly over the drones. Wall. I'm pretty sure that the cartels would soon collect bribes at the key points on the wall. The wall will help enrich cartels, and also there'd yeah. be tons and tons of drones flying. Well, you know, goodies over it. If if you if you accept the rhetoric of the Federation for American Immigration Reform, an an organization which, which. Uh, held a immigration event in 2015 that Sheriff Jenkins went to, they they want armed military on the wall at all times. They want armed drones. They want they want turrets, gun turrets on the wall. All because of- they see this as a military invasion. And on some level, I think Sheriff Jenkins probably agrees with them. I think he went to an immigration event that was hosted by a white supremacist organization and he either didn't know who they were or didn't care probably didn't care and said well hey these folks are anti-immigrants well then you know what they're all right with me yeah so a wall against the a a wall a more poor but relatively friendly country yeah Uh, what's a wall gonna do about the 60 miles from cuba to uh the tip of of florida what is the wall going to do if cartels already infil- infiltrated police in the southern states at the border? Yeah, you, you have just... cartels who are infiltrating police in the southern states along the border. And in most of the other states in the United States, you know who is infiltrating the police? White supremacists. In 2005 and in 2006, the FBI released two reports entitled White Supremacist Infiltration of Law Enforcement. No. What, they they were they were talking about this. The FBI knows this is happening. But what have they done to prevent it? Nothing. Can they? It's a cultural thing. At least the FBI is not taking a side with them. Yeah. Apparently. Well, and, <laughs> maybe because they just see it as an obsolete incivility that would not help the state become. Stronger. I don't know. I I really don't know. But I see a threat like that, and I think, my God, what's happening? You know. What's happening? The uh, uncivilized and educated people are taking out their anger, and they want to build a wall with, with machine guns. Yeah. And uh, 
all that money could be spent on something more productive like building a colony on Mars. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> a couple moon missions. But we don't want to make human beings' lives better. We want to destroy them. And that's what's really sad about the human condition because we're more interested in killing each other than we are in lifting each other up. I think that the amount of manpower versus the amount of opportunities kind of regulates that. So we go in the Rousseau mode, uh, mm -hmm. meh, old people are brothers, when there are more opportunities, when there's an obvious open new frontier. And mm -hmm. we go in the Hobbes mode and uh, war of all against all, when the amount of people exceeds the opportunities and so human lives sort of require a negative sign mm -hmm. i think that it's actually a very neg it's a very natural process that makes people go into into war specifically uh, a spanish american war could be examined from that theory's perspective and yet we may we just need to become aware that we have those tendencies that when they're human lives are too cheap we tend to get violent and try to sort of instinctively pursue a, a way to to kill off some population and maybe we just need to learn to not to to plan for it to engine to design a society where there is no cheap human life mm -hmm. human life has been so cheap in that we don't care when we destroy millions of people's lives every day Yes. The, the 2008 financial crash, that was one of the things that first really woke me up. Was, you know, tens of thousands of people died flat out from that economic disaster, which cut off their access to medicine, food, shelter. Tens of thousands of people dead flat out. Millions of people lost everything they had. Everything. Also, a handful of men could make a few billion dollars. Yes. What what is that to them? The, the, the so millions of human lives that were ruined, tens of thousands of people that died flat out. That's nothing to them. They 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 would massacre millions of people in order to get billions and trillions of dollars. Yeah, well, they just look at people as some kind of expendable. Yes, expendable. Like we look at bread yeast that first we do the yeah. work of producing carbon dioxide and then get baked alive. <sighs> So, I don't yeah. understand. It certainly takes a certain disconnect. And certain well, they're very disconnected, yeah. They're very disconnected from humanity, from the idea that people are equal. I have this crazy idea that people are equal, and when you have millions and billions of dollars, you don't see that. You don't see people as equal. You see people as beneath you. I think that starts at the level of our local local bourgeoisie actually 